was all right. Let's just see about that. This one down. That beautiful gymnopathy. All right, I'm on the screen. Okay. <clears throat> Checking we're all good. Uh, all right. Someone give me a thumbs up on audio. And we'll get started. This is my late night voice. Yeah, so um, Tyson, I, I won't be coming to uni to the careers day. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Mostly all right. This is just the best. Uh... Yeah, I won't give you a. Uh... <laughs> yeah, Tyson. But I don't want to make everyone else go and have their uh, their brains tickled with a stick. Um. Okay, so this is what we had um, uh, yes the uh, uh, I said, yeah come out of quarantine you start seeing people um, especially people with kids and then the kids spread it and then you catch it off the kids and it's like ah oh, great <clears throat> anyway Spent most of yesterday afternoon asleep, so my marking was not quite as uh, advanced as I'd, I'd hoped. Yeah, okay, so anyway, <clears throat> let's start with, um, yeah, so we had this corollary, the Maya Viatoris um, theorem, and this is a version for delta sets, so we'll see another version for topological spaces um, shortly. Um, <clears throat> once we do topological spaces so what does it tell us it tells us that if we have um, some delta set and some sub delta sets uh, that you that their union is all of X then which is enough to tell us that this square is a push out um, we get a short exact sequence of cochain complexes which we already knew but then we get a long exact sequence of cohomology modules um, <clears throat> and so this allows us to link sort of relate things like um, the cohomology of X to the cohomology of U and V and the cohomology of U intersection V but just now in different dimensions all right and I made a note that um, if everything's finite dimensional then the uh, the sequence ends so it's a long exact sequence starts with always starts with a zero so this map this map here is always injective um, and then it ends with a zero and so multiple frames per second tests ah oh, that's incredible yeah I don't know what it is um, I don't know if it's the order in which I open things up um, yeah, or it's a um, different intro music file which is maybe shorter and so it doesn't have to keep that in RAM in OBS, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, so the last map is always subjective um, when the thing is finite dimensional. So let's say uh, it was uh, k-dimensional. Let's say, uh, you, so u-intersection v being k-dimensional. So they might actually be lower dimension than x for instance I say let's say u intersection v is k plus 1 dimensional then this map delta k plus 1 and say x is um, k plus 1 dimensional as well this is a zero map so I know this is on to I mean if it happened that let's say u and v were uh, k plus 1 dimensional but their intersection was lower dimensional so I mean for instance I could do things like 
um, they're intersecting in some lower dimensional thing like a face, some volumes, but they intersect in a face, then this term would be zero. And so this map would be, would be on two. So you can tell things instantly from very little information. All right, so I had this exercise, which um, <clears throat> would be good to do at some point, but I'll uh, leave that for now. Um, <clears throat> so let's take let's take um, so instead of taking an X. Uh, that we sort of know and then look at sub things of it. We're going to take an X that's built out of sub things So let's imagine we had uh, A pair of n simplices We can call this one u say and this one v And we take this push out So just knowing that uh, the left vertical map and the top horizontal map are uh, injective, that tells us that the, the other maps are injective as well. Um, <clears throat> then we get a long exact sequence and I'll just draw a, a sample bit of it. Um, we have H, K, so this bit is going to be here would be H, K uh, of delta N plus H, K of delta N, but that's actually zero. And so here we get uh, h k plus one x, whatever that is. This is going to be h k. I'll just write it short, squared, but that's equal to zero. And this is h k plus one delta n squared, but that's also equal to zero. And this is for k, right? So for this thing to be zero here in the middle, uh, k has to be uh, non-zero. So this is for all k greater than or equal to 1. And so this is exact, and it doesn't matter what everything else is, as soon as I have in a long exact sequence a 0, an m, an n, and a 0, and then whatever. Alright, go back to um, sort of when we first started thinking about these uh, this map is let's call this map phi it's the same thing as phi being an isomorphism So it's better than just saying they're isomorphic. We have a map and we know that map's an isomorphism. And what is that map? That map is the co-boundary map. Now, if you're thinking ahead to um, actual topology, like, uh, <clears throat> and this is a combinatorial thing, but if you had two standard topological n simplices and glued them, like, that's basically like a spiky ball, a spiky solid ball, and you two glue two of them on their boundaries, that's like making a sphere one dimension higher. Um, and so, and the boundary of standard n simplex is like a spiky sphere 
Uh, there should be a plus one here. <clears throat> um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't write that zero that equals horizontally. Oops. Please don't crash. Boo. Right, we'll just have to continue from where we uh from where we left off. Oh, this is a long way back. Alright, let's just delete everything here. Oops. Get rid of that. Oh no, it's not as bad as I thought. Get rid of that. And uh, yellow. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> And you can see like what happens when, um, so let's just write that again as boundary map from K that's isomorphic to H K plus one. Uh, and so it almost seems like there's some kind of induction -y type thing here, except that, um, <coughs> like the shape of the things is wrong the sort of if you're thinking to squishy topology it's about right um so this is k greater than or equal to one but what happens when k is zero um, so let's just write down the bottom end of this thing so it's zero x uh h zero squared and then h zero um should be s is now partial zero uh one x r and now we're up to uh h one involving delta n's which is zero Okay, so now I have um, uh, an exact sequence with three, potentially three uh, um, non-trivial things. But we actually know some of these, some of this, right? So this is equal to uh, squared, um, and so let's write that in zero. And I'll write it out in short. So this here is is one to this is injective zero H one X. Alright, so now and this is on to and this is exact. Um <clears throat> and then uh kind of have to think a little bit harder about what's going on All right so we could actually calculate um, some of these other ones so we could calculate this uh, maybe yeah probably um, because we could look at their like their underlying directed graphs um, <coughs> and with a bit of effort, we see that this is equal to R. Um, this this has the same. Uh, let's see. In fact, all of these have the same. Yeah. I'm sort of using my advanced wizard skills here. But let's let's say when you calculate these things, this is the diagonal map. So it sends r to r comma r, and this map is the difference um, because the maps from like the the boundary of the 
boundary of the n simplex is equal to the n minus 1 skeleton of the n simplex and so in particular um, they have the same set of zero simplices, the same vertices and um, and the inclusion map is the identity and this is enough to show that x0 is the same as as that and all the maps in the pushout square of zero simplices are isomorphisms so this is enough to show that that's the diagonal this map sends r comma s to their difference uh, and which is enough then to show that so no not green because that's bad um, So you get this kind of bootstrapping process where um, <clears throat> you sort of throw in what you know and see what it implies and see if you can make any more simplifications. So this uh, map star is subjective and sometimes you say I know what this map is doing so I can infer something about the module and sometimes you say I know what the module is so it tells me what the maps need to be. Um, so since a star is subjective, that means the kernel of the double star here is equal to everything. Um, but that map is also onto. So everything is being sent to zero by the double star map. So I double star is zero map, but that it's a zero map and it's subjective. Um, so H one X is the zero module. Okay. That's kind of cool. Um, does that tell us anything else? I don't think so. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so going back up to here, this... Um, so this uh, isomorphism here only told us what H2, H3... Uh, the double head arrow is subjective the double star one uh, and the the single star one was subjective because I know the map from R squared to R which takes a difference is subjective because I could take R comma zero and it maps it to R and that's arbitrary um, oh, uh, so the notation in general yeah so that's I've been sort of writing it as I've been saying it, but I haven't sort of formally defined it. So like an arrow with two heads. I've been saying subjective and writing this, but that can easily slip by. Um, so Chris, when you look at what the maps defined to be, it's the difference between the restriction maps. Um, like you go back to what the Maya via Taurus, like, sorry, not the, the, the definition of the map originally in the short exact sequence. Um, so you have something in C bullet of X and then you restrict to C bullet of U and C bullet of V and then you restrict both of those to the intersection and then take the difference of them and that's the definition of the map 
um, the only trick is to like know what the modules are and uh, what the restriction map is. But here the restriction map um, at the level of zero simplices is it's the identity map um, because of these facts in white. <coughs> Because you write down the zero dimensional part of this push out, it's um, it's like the identity map. The identity map. And then you calculate what's well, disjoint union of the two things divided by an equivalence relation. And it's, you can take it to be the identity map. <clears throat> okay. So we haven't like explicitly calculated all the cohomology of X, but um, we do know the cohomology of X in terms of a cohomology of a standard object, um, which in principle we can go and calculate that and then we start to get cohomology of other more interesting things. Okay, any questions about that? So this technique is hugely powerful. So once you know you've got a short exact sequence of cochain complexes, then all this machinery comes out. Which is why it's kind of like takes three lectures to prove because it's a it's a really serious theorem. Um, <clears throat> so I've got another corollary. So that's sort of Mayo via Taurus. Now we get the long exact sequence of pairs. The long exact, sorry, corollary. It's a long exact sequence. For relative cohomology. <clears throat> So we had a short exact sequence uh, by definition. Just omitting the R's for brevity here. So this left term is defined to be the kernel of the restriction map. So we get this long exact sequence. So the utility of this will be more apparent once we get to topological spaces. Um, but whatever relative cohomology is, we now have a means of calculating it in terms of ordinary cohomology. Oh, I forgot some R's here. Um, 
partial zero. Yeah, thanks you. Everyone's spotting. Yeah, Chris, it's like to get past this. I think I mentioned before. The next thing after this is spectral sequences, which is the the uh, the, the OG like boss calculational tool. Except it's really complicated. Um, <clears throat> This is like the baby case. It still is pretty awesome. Okay, so let's see an example that um, uh, <laughs> that's called Space Kidder. Um, sorry, I. I star, I um, test, I is the map, the injective map that includes A into X. And then I star is the map which is the restriction map. Um, so Chris, a spectral sequence. Um, <clears throat> so a spectral sequence. Um, So imagine, let, let me just, just small digression. All right. So imagine this information I've somehow broken. Uh, yes, yes, Tessa. So a pair is, is defined to be a thing and then a sub thing. Yeah, if I did it like X comma A with no brackets, and I'll just say X comma A are delta sets. It's not a, it's, it's a technical term, not a, plain language term um, yeah so somehow X is filtered I have things in a and then more stuff imagine I had like a long chain of like sub Delta sets maybe I mean <clears throat> one one thing to think about is the you take all the skeleton so the zero skeleton the one skeleton the two skeleton and they all form a big chain of increasing Delta sets uh, whose, whose union is X um, and imagine there was something like this tool, like this long exact sequence, except which was sensitive to like all those stages. Um, and it's, you don't get a long exact sequence, you get other, um, uh, you get other algebraic data. And then in the case that you just say, well, I just take two things, A and X, all of that algebraic data collapses down into the spectral sequence as a as a degenerate case. So that's Chris. That's roughly how it works. Um, Tess. So it's just uh, I just think of it as an injective map. Um, so like the inclusion of a subset is an injective map it's just a particularly like special one and it doesn't you know in the definition of a pair it doesn't literally have to be a subset it can just be some injective map okay so that's that's another example but we'll come back to this um so for instance, uh, I mean, this is one way in which you can see that um, reduced cohomology is the same as ordinary cohomology in every dimension except dimension zero, because then, all right, so reduced cohomology So then this takes A to be a single uh, single zero cell, sorry, uh, zero simplex. <clears throat> and then your cohomology of A is rather boring. So that's zero everywhere above dimension zero.
Um, and so you get, so this is enough to say, uh, HK twiddle of X is HK of X for all K greater than uh, K not zero. And then uh, H tweedle zero is like the kernel of the evaluation map at X. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to have another example of that's similar to this. Um, so let's take another example. So let's take this push out. Oh, I was going to look up that notation. Sorry, one moment while I quickly look something up. Ah, oh, what? That's searching and math thing and you get knitting videos. That's no good. Um, I want this. So this is a push out. So it's a disjoint union of X and Y where I just specify that X is equivalent to Y. So X is a zero simplex, Y is a zero simplex. And this, they are specified by mapping from the zero simplex, the standard like combinatorial zero simplex into the delta sets X and Y. So your cartoon you might like to keep in mind is X and here's little X. And something contrasting. And this is Y and this is little Y. So I've just, so yeah, it's the wedge sum in not so many words. So I've tucked, stuck two things together and I say, well, what's the cohomology of the thing that's stuck together? <clears throat> so we can look at our Maya Via Taurus uh, long exact sequence. I'm just going to look at a generic portion. Um, H, um, if I forget to write an R in there, Probably mean to. And this is exact. My via Taurus. But we know what the cohomology of a point is. 
<clears throat> and so as long as um, k, so let's look at this right, so if k is bigger than 1, then this is 0. And this is zero. Uh, this is K. It maps to zero. So that's an isomorphism. <coughs> and so we might ask, now we can look at the, the low dimensions as we did before. So let's look at the this is kind of a generic bit of the um, of the long exact sequence. Let's look at low dimensions. So we always start with a zero. I'm just going to leave out the R's now for space. Right, so I know this is going to be R because that's what it does. <coughs> have H1 wedge sum H1x. And then H1 of delta zero, but that equals zero. So I've got one, two, three, four, five non-zero terms. Yeah, so Chris, it's a, uh, there are things one can do. Um, so let's see, pa, 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 pa. so I know this is injective and this is mapping to zero, and so this map is subjective. So I had to write it out again. Because you've got to think about what is this map that uh, this one here, this star, Um, onto x h1 y 0 um, so this map star is so we have to restrict uh, what are we doing I've lost the my little push out picture so I gotta zoom out a little bit so this map star is I take something in H0 of X and Y. So uh, it would be an equivalence class, but it's in H0, so it's in the kernel of delta 0. Um, so it's represented by a map from the 0 simplices into R. And then I have to restrict along here, but that's the same thing as evaluating that function at X or at y. So this takes an f and a g and sends it to f at x um, <coughs> minus g of y. And that's uh, onto because I can always find, given a thing in R, I can always find a pair of functions that under this map will give me that element. And we have to check, um, so we always take g to be zero, and <coughs> I know x is not empty because it has a point little x in it, and so um, 
one can use one's knowledge of, of uh, directed graphs, for instance, the underlying directed graph of X, to figure out that um, there is something non-trivial in, in H0 X. So that is onto, and so then this here is the zero map. And so that means the image of the zero map is the kernel of the next map, which means it's injective. So this double star map is injective. I should say has equal the image of the zero map uh, and so double star is an isomorphism and um, we also get a short exact sequence. Uh, so now if we look at this, well, let me just write that down. Um, so H1, X wedge sum Y is the same as the direct sum algebraically of the cohomology of X and Y. Okay, so uh, that's extending our isomorphism we had before. So we had this isomorphism here for k greater than 1. Now we have it for k equals 1. So we needed a bit more um, sort of reasoning and a bit of information about bits and pieces in the short exact sequence. Okay, so now what have we got left? Uh, this maps onto R. And there's another map, but just by knowing that it's onto R tells me that I can throw a zero in there and this is a short exact sequence because I already knew it was like exact here and exact here so this is injective the image of this injective map is the same as a kernel of the double star map and because the double sorry the single star map and because the single star map is subjective I have a short exact sequence even if it's not literally the all of the pieces come from the sequence I had originally. <clears throat> okay, so remember this is f g maps to f of x minus g of y and at this point all I could say is that uh, the zero cohomology is the subspace of, or the submodule of the direct sum of the cohomologies of the zero cohomologies of x and y such that um, f evaluated x is the same as g evaluated at y. Okay. I mean that's a thing, but it's it's not very explicit. Um, yeah, 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 working down. Okay, so here's so suppose so here's a special case. Suppose x and y. Uh, let's say x0 and y0 are finite.
then um, like H0x is a submodule of um, the module of functions from x0 to r, but if it's finite, this is a free module of rank the size of x. And similarly with y, um, uh, number of things in y naught, and their submodules are free modules, so they're free. Um, Um, <clears throat> and then, oh, we know that H0 of X wedge sum Y and so that's also free. Um, <clears throat> And we know it's the kernel of a particular map. Um, let's see, how do I want to write this? So this is like the rank of H0x plus the rank of H0y. Um, And that's the subjective map. Um, <clears throat> and so, if you, you know, write out well, this this is a there's a matrix. So what is it? It's going to be a, a one by n for a suitable n matrix, and it's subjective. Um, so in particular, it's not the zero map. And then you go, well, that means there's n minus one pivots in this um, reduced, sorry. There's a pivot in this one by n matrix. And so there's n minus one free variables. And so this is enough where n is this exponent here. And it tells us that rank of h0 finally is equal to the rank of h0x plus the rank of h0, y, minus 1. Sure, all right. <clears throat> so we've pretty much identified the cohomology of this delta set this wedge sum delta set um, pure, all in terms of the cohomology of X and Y. I mean, actual isomorphisms um, for all sort of positive dimension cohomologies and for dimension zero we can at least count the the ranks um, yeah and there's a bit more you can say but that's a little bit fiddly all right so that was a like massive detailed um, example so I wanted to give you something where you could actually see it all in action where you get to a more or less satisfactory answer. I mean, these are very special cases because um, some of the uh, delta sets involved have kind of boring cohomology. But this low dimensional stuff, sometimes you need to do all this more fiddling around, not just like in dimension zero and one, but in higher dimensions as well. Um, 
Okay. It's a lot to absorb, so. <clears throat> so here's here's another um, less high powered example. Let's take um, a directed graph. So we can make good on a promise that I made earlier. And let's say the directed graph is something like this. And in fact, I'm going to do better than that. So one could also do things like um, so it's a graph with two cycles. <clears throat> um, so for instance, this right hand one, I could denote this as um, the, the previous example, like say if the left hand side of it sort of this side was x and this side was y and this this point was like the x equals y point um, so then I can say all I have for a directed graph is h0 and h1 and um, I can now calculate h1 because I know how to do the, the, the h1 of a directed graph that looks like a polygon and of one that looks like a polygon with some uh, little tail attached. So I could have made this joining bar, if you like. Um, this joining bar here, this could be longer. Okay, so that's so that this is one is a special case of what we just did. Um, and I think maybe it's a good idea to work through that like specific, even if you want to write down like it's a pentagon and a hexagon joined by a little linkage of three, um, three edges, and sort of use use what you know to really push it down to like super explicit. Um, but we can also do something like this left hand one and so what I'm going to do is um, I want to think of this um, X is the whole thing I'm gonna let you uh, be like the outside so I'm not drawing directions on these edges because it doesn't matter what they are they can be anything and I'm going to let V, oops, let me just contrast. I'm going to make that be this, this joining edge here. Um, and then their intersection, right, what's their intersection? It's equal to the disjoint union of two things, uh, two sort of solo vertices. In fact, this is equal to delta one. And so, sort of U is a polygon directed graph. Um, And V is something we, we either calculate the cohomology of directly or we kind of just um, know as a special case of the cohomology of delta N. Uh, and the cohomology of the intersection is something we, we can find very easily. And so then you can apply, uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, Charles, that's, um, 
That's right. As it turns out. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and so this is a case where we can then calculate h1 of x without um, yeah Tyson I'm not going to go into the career thing so um, this is just where I was going to end um, <clears throat> yeah we can use my via torus to do this and then you can kind of do induction to say what does it mean to have cycles you know can I reduce the number of cycles by re either removing um, an edge or disconnect my graph by removing an edge like in the case that's in the, the little white box at right and then use induction to actually show that h1 does really count the number of cycles anyway i'll leave it there you've got to run off to the um the career thing if you're actually in adelaide but otherwise um uh yeah i hope you enjoy the thing um i was actually quite looking forward to it because by the end of this year I'd need another job uh, I think a career is probably a thing to have um, <clears throat> yeah alright cool um, Marks will be out today and I, I'm get the, the quizzes out so there'll be a stack of them out at once um, but you'll have like a few days like a half a week or so to do them um, and they'll catch up with us so we don't sort of keep doing quizzes all the way up to the exam all right, cool. Catch you later, everyone.